Welcome to Chapter 35, Neurosurgery. Neurosurgery is a specialization of the brain, spine, and peripheral nerves. The neuron is the primary cell type of the nervous system and is located throughout the body. The neuron has three main parts. The soma, which acts as the sending and receiving area for nerve impulses, and is also the energy center for the cell. The axon, which is right here, carries the nerve pulses away from the cell. You see I underline this here, soma, sending and receiving area, axon, away from the cell, just to help you memorize that. Um, and then we have the dendrites, and dendrites carry nerve impulses toward the cell. The skull covers and protects the brain. It is composed of bony plates that are connected by a thin membrane called a suture. The major bones of the skull are the, are the following. Uh, we have one frontal bone that provides structure for the forehead and orbits. That's this yellow guy here. Two peri parietal bones on either side of the skull and these provide structure for the sides and the roof of the cranium. So how you see two is you see this side and then if we turned, if that skull flipped around it would be on the other side, connected by that suture. We have two temporal bones on either side of the skull that contribute to the structure for the sides of the cranium. We also have one occipital bone that provides structure to the back of the skull the skull, and a portion of the floor of the cranium. Directly beneath the skull lie three protective coverings of the brain, the meninges. meninges. We have the outer, what you can see here is the outermost layer, or the dura, which is this section right here. Now it's flipped up because what you're seeing here is the periosteum and the dura. They kind of work together as one functional layer. Um, it's, it's a tough tissue that, that uh, actually has to be cut through. You can see it very clearly uh, during a craniotomy um, cutting through the dura. Uh, the middle layer is what you see right here. This is the arachnoid um, matter. This looks like a spider web, which is why you get that arachnoid um, name for it. it has, it's kind of like a thin layer and kind of meshy. Uh, the inner layer would be considered the subarachnoid space, and this space is filled with CSF or cerebrospinal fluid. The brain itself is divided into three main sections. The cerebrum, or forebrain, which you can see right here, um, controls all motor activity and sensory impulses. The cerebellum, or hindbrain, lies under the posterior cerebrum and is the second largest area of the brain. It controls coordination, movement, and equilibrium. And then we have the brainstem, which you can see right here. The brainstem is composed into three sections, and this is a better picture of that brainstem. Um, the medulla oblongata, which you can see right here, midbrain, right there, and the pons, which is right here. The midbrain is located between the forebrain and the hindbrain. Major structures of the midbrain, things to remember, are the thalamus, hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and pineal gland. The brain requires 20% more oxygen than other organs to function adequately. It receives arterial blood from the internal carotid arteries as well as the ver ver vertebral arteries. The circle of Willis, which you can see right here, is located at the base of the brain and communicates with the other arteries in the brain to ensure a continuous blood 
blood flow. If you have a blockage in one space, that circle of Willis is going to let blood in from other areas so that we continue to oxygenate the brain. Uh, the vertebral column provides structure and protect, protects the spinal cord. The column is composed of 24 bones or vertebrae in addition to the sacrum and coccyx. So as you can see here, we have the cervical vertebrae, which are, there's seven bones, the thoracic vertebrae with 12, the lumbar vertebrae with five, the sacral vertebrae with five, but they're fused together, and the coccyx, which is actually one to three bones, but they are all fused together as well. The spinal cord is located within the vertebral canal and is continuous with the medulla oblongata of the hindbrain. The cord originates at the foramen magnum, this is that large opening at the base of the skull, and then terminates in the cauda equine at the first and second lumbar vertebrae. The cranial nerves are 12 pairs of nerves that originate in the brain and are responsible for the sensory and motor functions of the body. If you remember when we were discussing eyes, um, we talked about that eighth cranial um, uh, nerve that um, had an impact on our vision. Um, what uh, I want you to do, what you have to make sure you do here, is memorize these, really get to know these cranial nerves. Um, it's, you can find it in page 943 in Fuller's. You want to make sure that you can know the cranial nerve name as well as what it controls. The spinal nerves occur in pairs as well and originate from the spinal cord near their corresponding vertebrae. In other words, these nerves are called cervical spinal nerves because they're in that cervical section of the spine. The peripheral nerves are composed of small bundles of nerve fibers called fascicles, which are surrounded by a sheath called the endoneurium. <coughs> Excuse me. A variety of imaging studies may be performed before neurosurgery. You can see an extensive list here. Most of these we have discussed in the past, but a couple that might be a little new to you um, would be the electroencephalogram, or EEG. Uh, this measures the electricity, electrical activity of the brain. It can be used to identify seizure disorders or head injury or dementia. Another exam is the electromyography, or EMG. This exam would measure the conduction rate of the motor nerves. Neurosurgery patients may appear to be unaware or conscious, unco um, I'm sorry, be unaware or unconscious, but may actually be highly aware of your surroundings. Uh, if you check YouTube, you can find um, brain surgeries that are done while people are playing the guitar or working on their computer so we can check for um, uh, function. Um, because of this we need to be really careful um, about all sorts of things when it comes to case planning. So while that patient comes into the room and we're still working we're very cautious about about uh, our communication. Uh, consider that that patient is awake. Also consider patient fears. Um, you know, brain surgery is a big, big deal. They have the potential to uh, not walk, lose their sight, lose their hearing, lose mobility. Um, so very serious procedure and you have to make sure that you um, provide emotional and psychological support to that patient. What you see here is a photo of a Mayfield table. It's a massive, almost like a Mayo stand. Um, it's used instead of a Mayo stand, actually, and it pulls up directly over the patient. You can see this folded edge here of the drape. I, it might be difficult to see, but this is actually a folded edge of the drape so that this pulls over the patient, and then this drape attaches. The head of the patient would be right here. 
and that drape goes down so that we don't have a big, you know, that patient's not exposed to the underneath of the table. Um, we'd also have a back table set up with this. You can see the amount of supplies, very similar to like a heart where you have tons and tons of stuff. Um, if you are performing performing a craniotomy, you may also need a headrest. I'll talk to you about those in a couple slides. Um, neural rooms always have a microscope that live in the room and can be available at any time. And then you'll also need bipolar cautery. Most ESU units now typically have the ability to switch over to bipolar, so it should not require a special um, piece of equipment. But you definitely will want the um, instrument itself, the bipolar pickups. Um, sponges are a little bit different. Uh, Raytech are definitely the primary use, um, but the surgeon may also use small square felted sponges made of cotton or rayon. These are called cottonoids or patties, and they're used to control bleeding on neural and vascular tissue. They're a very gentle um, absorbing sponge. The surgeon may also use a cottonoid um, or a cotton ball are also used for uh, craniotomies um, on top of tissue and then use the suction above that and it will work like a filter so that it doesn't cause any damage to the tissue, to the gentle tissue below. Uh, dressings that you need to consider, um, cranial incisions, we're talking about something that you see here, a non-adherent non strip like a telfa or mesh um, would go directly on the wound, 4x4s four four above that, and then 4x4s four four turned into fluffs. Um, after that, then a soft roll gauze would be wrapped around to keep it in place. Spinal incisions, very um, simple, non-adherent telfa, 4x4, four four and tape. Patient positioning is going to be a huge consideration um, when you're talking about neurosurgery. We're going to be, we could be um, either supine or prone. We could be using a headrest or we could be using a um, padding. Um, cranial procedures are often performed with the patient in the prone or supine position. Um, and then the head is typically extended over the operating table and secured with a fixation frame. That's what you see here. The head, so this would sit um, into clamps in the bed and then the head rests inside these tongs. These skull tongs, um, the one you see here is a Mayfield. Um, there's another type, it's called a Gardner Wells tongs. Um, it's used to secure the patient's head in a particular position so that it's there's no chance of it moving at all. Even if somebody bumps it, that thing is staying exactly still. You can see why this is necessary when we get into um, brain tissue a slip of the hand or, or a patient moving would be devastating. A craniotomy uh, is one of the procedures um, that you'll see in it, and it may be required to provide access for treatment of a variety of intracranial conditions. This would be aneurysm or tumor or hematoma. Um, all are accessed through the craniotomy. Patient is placed in the supine or prone sitting position or sitting position. Um, during a craniotomy, after they make the incision, the, the scalp bleeds um, pretty extensively. So what you see here are rainy clips, and I want you to remember those because when I'm in the instrument presentation, we're going to talk about the rainy clips. Um, after the rainy clips are applied, uh, often a section of bone is removed. Uh, that's called the bone flap. It, the size of it depends on the size of the tumor that has to be uh, dealt with or the amount of access that they need to the brain. A burr hole is a case that you might do when you're on call. Uh, these are typically uh, after trauma. Um, it's most often done to relieve pressure on the brain. So if you, let's say somebody has head trauma of some kind, whether it was a car accident, uh, you, we know that when tissue is damaged, it begins to swell, 
right? So when it swells, the skull does not allow for any room for that brain to swell. So it will cause so much pressure on the brain that it will cause, can cause brain death and, um, or extreme, uh, problems with the different areas of the brain. So getting that pressure out sometimes is just a matter of creating a burr hole and allowing the blood or CSF fluid to escape so that it doesn't um, add to the pressure. Uh, the last procedure I'm going to talk in, you can see in your book that there is a numerous amount of procedures, so it's always a good idea to YouTube them, check them out, um, see the different intricacies with each procedure. Um, but the other procedure I'm going to talk about here is laminectomy and discectomy. It's the most common that you'll see as far as back surgery is concerned. Uh, laminectomies are most often performed to decompress the spinal column in cases of spinal stenosis or to gain access to a spinal cord tumor, or as a step in a more extensive surgery to correct a spinal deformity. A uh, discectomy is used to treat a herniation of the inter intervertebral disc. That's such a hard word to say. Sorry about that, guys. Um, seen here, what you'll see here is two different um, spine procedures. The lumbar spine surgery, the reason they're referring to that as lumbar is it's done on the lumbar spine, that lumbar section. So if you go back to that picture of your spine and it's telling you the different sections um, of vertebrae, this is the lumbar section. When you see here, this is the thoracic spine fusion. That's done in the thoracic level of the spine. <clears throat> 